Hello everyone and welcome back to day 27 of Bitwise where we could a complete software hardware stack for a civil computer from scratch. So um, today the plan is just to more or less continue where we left off yesterday with the beginning of the static assembler. Um, yesterday was mostly um, just sort of, I guess, getting getting things going with the Lexer, uh, moving over some code from our existing C code base uh, to make it easy. Uh, we're planning on doing a Lexer in exactly the same style that we did the ion Lexer. In fact, sharing the lexical syntax um, as much as possible. And um, I continued doing that off stream. And so uh, just before we jump in, I just want to mention what I brought over and the stuff I potentially ran into in the process. So um, let's see. I moved over a bunch of stuff from common.c. So a bunch of things that were macros are now uh, functions. Downside, of course, is that these are tied now to specific types as opposed to being kind of polymorphic uh, the way macros can be. Uh, on the upside, of course, they are easier to debug since they're functions. Um, they don't have weird issues potentially with multiple evaluation of operand expressions and yeah. Uh, and all the usual advantages of functions over macros, but downside is some of these had to have to be specialized for specific types, um, which can get a little bit uh, annoying as the combinations kind of multiply, but uh, not too bad for the specific case. Uh, the other thing I moved over, well, we already actually, so let me mention one modification I added here. Um, so we already had this uh, stretchy buff stuff. I don't think I really changed anything uh, other than the cookie. So one thing I added, um, this is something I've done in past implementations, but um, given some of the string cast or pointer casting, I thought it would be a good idea to uh, to put this in now. Um, and I think it's worth talking about since it's kind of a general technique um, that you can apply in a lot of different situations. And uh, in, in C especially where uh, working with raw memory is um, the norm. And uh, it's the idea of putting a, a magic cookie in the header of a stretchy buff. And so this number is a 64-bit number. I literally just used Python to generate a 64-bit number in hex and stuck it in. So there's no particular uh, method to uh, these hex digits. They're just literally a random number that I generated. And the idea then is um, you have this buff cookie function. If you call it with a null pointer, you know, remember that null pointers and stretchy buffers uh, are interpreted as being empty buffers. So if you pass in a null pointer, you get the, the cookie value. Is, so this is kind of assuming that a null pointer is a valid buffer. Uh, otherwise, you read the cookie that's actually stored in the buffer header. Um, and the way this then works is when we initialize the buffer for the first time in buff grow, we fill in that header field with um, this constant. And the idea now is uh, at various points, and you can be more or less, uh, I guess, uh, more or less hardcore about how, how, how often you check this. I just check it in these two kind of mutating functions that, that actually grow the structure. Um, but you could put it, you know, you could put it even in these accessors if you wanted to. Um, but anyway, in those cases, you can, uh, you can assert that, um, that the cookie is indeed as expected. And you could even put this in, you know, it, right now it's an assert, which means it's going to get compiled out in debug builds. But, you know, you could have this potentially be a, um, a separate compile time switch if you're trying to hunt down bugs or something like that, uh, even in release builds. But um, the idea here is if you accidentally misinterpret a pointer as being something else um, that, other than a buffer pointer, uh, then this should have a very high likelihood of catching it because you're unlikely in the extreme to have a random pointer uh, point to, you know, be at the, just the right offset from something, uh, from some 64-bit value that has exactly the right uh, value, right? So um, this can happen accidentally, but um, it's uh, highly unlikely. Um, probably you would, would need to be reusing memory and anyway. So uh, this is sort of a standard technique. You can use it um, you know, it's, it's commonly used, uh, variants of this technique are commonly used for uh, memory, like for checking for buffer overruns as well. So one thing you can do is uh, after a buffer, uh, you can put a magic cookie um, that is initialized at init time to some specific value. And then if someone overwrites that value, you will be able to tell by reading it back and checking that uh, it's not, you know, if it's not the expected value, you know someone touched it. Um, you can do that either in the header or the footer. 
Uh, of course, there's other techniques to catch buffer overruns, but that's one that requires very few assumptions about your operating system, for example, like you can use guard pages as well in some cases, but that might require you to reserve an entire page after a buffer. And for small buffers, that might not be feasible. So anyway, this general technique of putting a known value somewhere um, is a pretty good, um, pretty good precaution. It doesn't cost a whole lot um, to, uh, to to reserve, you know, in a, in a buffer like this, reserving eight bytes for a cookie is, um, in the grand scheme of things, for a variable length buffer is probably um, worth it and you could even if you wanted to you could make this only like you could potentially make this like be ha have a different data structure depending on whether you're debugging or not but i just chose to always make it be in the header and uh, then the thing that's kind of debug or non-debug dependent is the assert but the data structure is always the same um but anyway so i put that in um not didn't help me catch any particular bug, but I figured um, this was a good opportunity to put it in, and it might be helpful in the future. And th this is potentially also me thinking about, you know, if I want to make a more robust sort of reusable library version of, of stretchy buffers, I would definitely want this to be in there because, um, you know, uh, it's a it's a pretty valuable debug aid uh, once you start using using these things more aggressively in your code. So anyway, that was one thing uh, that I added to the existing code. The other stuff was just porting things over one to one more or less. So I ported over the arenas, if you guys remember the arena from way back. Um, and so that was, you know, like moving C code over is so easy. You just copy and paste it and do a few replacements and it just works. Moved over the hashing code, moved over the hash map code. Um, again, exactly the same stuff just gets a little bit tighter and shorter and whatnot in, in the process. Um, yeah, moved over the test code. I'm, I'm checking that all this test code still passes. Moved over the intern stuff. Um, one change I made with the interns is that I'm not using global variables. In fact, there's no global variables in any of this code here. Um, so um, now the intern, rather than having this arena and the map be global variables uh, and um, have these uh, stir intern functions kind of operate implicitly on that shared global state. You now pass a, pass in this uh, first parameter, which is like a context for the interning. And so these have been pulled into a struct. Um, but other than that, there's really nothing to it. Uh, it does mean you also have to, of course, manage the memory here since they're no longer global. Um, so you have to free this eventually. Um, but other than that, all we really did is now rather than accessing a global, we access the map of the arena through this uh, context pointer. Um, and so you can see these stir intern functions are now passing this interns um, this interns context. Um, and that was pretty much it. Um, and yeah, so let's add that actually. So that's that was kind of the point is we want to add this to the Lexer. So the Lexer now has a sort of fully encapsulated um, intern context when it's doing its interning to uh, to uniquify different identifiers. Um, and I think that was pretty much it. Um, and yeah, so just added some some test cases here for the, you know, uh, for the hash map. So it's just, you know, it's just going through and asserting and similarly for the, uh, the interning to make sure it all works. Um, just a quick aside, this actually helped me catch a few bugs. Actually, so let me mention, um, yesterday on stream, we ran into two minor uh, type resolver bugs or like things where it wasn't it wasn't allowing things that would be allowed in C. Uh, and I fixed both of those off stream. So the first one was, uh, I believe, I mentioned I wouldn't be talking so much about the compiler anymore, but I did want to mention that we actually fixed those. Um, so one of them was for ternaries. Um, Let's see here. For ternaries, I now allow, uh, you know, if one branch of the ternary is a null pointer, then that's always allowed with any other, uh, combined with any other pointer type. And in that case, the null, null, the non-null pointer type is the one that defines the return value or the, uh, the expression value, uh, the expression type of that ternary. So that was one thing. Um, the other thing I did was I had not been for uh, equality and non-equality. Um, let's see here for, yeah, for equality and non-equality previously, I had, uh, I had grouped these under the same, uh, kind of 
case as these uh, relational operators, and but and they're mostly the same. But one difference has to do with uh, with um, with the way you compare pointers. Um, let's see here, uh, void pointers and stuff like that. Right, right, right. So specifically, this clause is different. You can compare a void pointer to a non-void pointer um, without any casting. And so you can do, in C, you can do, and now in Ion, you can do stuff like, you know, you can do, like, if, if, if this is a void star, um, and this is like an int star, you know, I don't know. You can do something like this. Um, you can now do, you know, you can do, you can do this, or you can do this without any casting to a common pointer type. So this is sort of what you expect from void star being this kind of polymorphic type, almost polymorphic uh, pointer type. Um, and so um, that was added. And then there were two very minor things. Uh, one of them was that return, uh, I had, um, and this was provoked by uh, porting some code over, so it's been pretty good at just shaking out these very minor uh, type system resolving bugs. Uh, one thing was, um, if you look here, the return value of this function is char const star, but here I'm returning ints dot stir, and um, stir is a is an array; it's not a pointer. Uh, and it was complaining that you know it's expecting a char const star, but you're returning a, a char array of size one. And uh, the error was that for the return uh, for the return statement, I was resolving the operand using an L value context rather than an R value context. And so as a result, it wasn't decaying the array to a pointer in that context. Uh, and now it is. So that was just literally changing, I guess, six characters, adding these uh, six characters here. Um, and then the other one was um, I had previously been um, resolving string literals to a just like a char star. Uh, and now they actually uh, resolve to a an array of the right size. So this was provoked by, I think, intern test, where um, if you, I mean, this is a standard C idiom, right? But if you have, um, this is especially if you have an, an array with unknown size and you assign it to a string literal, this in, essentially infers the size of this array based on the string literal. And for this to work, um, you cannot kind of prematurely decay the string literal to have a char star type. It has to be a char array with the right size in order for this inference to work out. So that was literally just changing those from being type pointer to type char from, to being now type array, type char, and then getting the, the size of this buffer. Um, so anyway, those were, the, I guess, the, the, the four sort of minor fixes in the type resolver. Uh, and so this has been a, a good way to shake out these minor things. So anyways, so yeah, you can see here in this test case, really all we had to change is we now have a, uh, you know, we have a this local, locally scoped, local lifetime interns context, and then we free it at the end. Um, but this lives on the stack. Um, let me just talk about this idiom because this is an idiom that has been uh, becoming, uh, like I, I notice it popping up when I'm writing code and because it's so concise in ION as opposed to C, um, I think it's, it's worth kind of highlighting. Um, what we're doing here is just, uh, we're exploiting the fact that, uh, so this so this thing I've highlighted here, of course, is a compound literal. So this is um, creating a compound literal of type interns, and it's zero initializing the uh, the fields. And then we're taking the address of that and assigning it to interns. So interns is going to have type pointer to interns. Um, and um, you could have done it instead. So so let me show you sort of the alternative way of writing this. In fact, what I wrote initially. Initially, I had just written this. And then every time I had to call this function, I would manually take the address of this. Uh, and it's kind of repetitive. And it's very common, actually, that uh, you're dealing with these APIs that always take a pointer to something. They never work directly with the value type because they're kind of mutating the thing in place. Or maybe they're taking a const pointer and they're not mutating it in place, but they want to pass it by pointer rather than by value for efficiency reasons. Um, and so in that sort of case, really, even though something has stack lifetime, subsequently, you're always referring to it only through a pointer. 
And um, this is what this idiom lets you do. Because the reason it works like this is that uh, compound literals have the lifetime of the enclosing block. So this is basically the uh, the same as if you had written um, if, as if you had written this. Like this has the same meaning in terms of the lifetime as if you had an anonymous variable corresponding to that L value, um, and then you took the address of that. So this is exactly the same thing. Um, and anyway, I think there's actually multiple cases of me using it here. Yeah, I use it. So there's two cases just in just here. The other case again is like you have the lexer object, um, and even though it's uh, even though this L value lives on the stack, you only want to refer to it through a pointer, and so um, yeah. Anyway, so uh, you would in in if this was C99, you would write this as um, you could write it in C99, more or less the same, but much more verbose as this. Um, this has the same meaning, and in fact, I think if you uh, if you look at the code, I'm sure that's what the code actually says. Yeah, that's what it says, with a little more verbosity because of the name prefixing and the uh, extra parenthesis. But uh, but anyway, yeah. So uh, just wanted to highlight that idiom. If it looks weird, it's not some specialized syntax. It's just kind of combining multiple pieces of syntax into some some nice tight stuff. Um, all right. So um, anyways. Now that, uh, let's just get into the coding, shall we? Um, so we still have a few more things to add to the lexer, but all the hard stuff is done because I ported all this, uh, all this infra from the old code. And so I think uh, if you look at the lexer right now, um, so we have, uh, we have these token types. I think we want to add the token name right now, now that we have the interning. Uh, and so, I think we can just go and refer to our old code. Right, we have this stuff here. Um, this should shrink by quite a lot. You know, it would be nice if we had uh, ranges for this stuff. rather than um, sort of manual items. This might be a good excuse to add it, to be honest. Maybe I should add it. Should I add it right now? That is the question. Alrighty. Yeah, actually, let's add them. So let's add some syntax to do this kind of thing, because then I can do, um, then you can do this. That seems to me like a good idea, potentially. Um, yeah, let's add that, to be honest, because we probably want to add that eventually. I know this was not supposed to be a compiler stream, but this should be not too, uh, not too bad. Um, so, so let's first see the existing uh, case handling. Um, so what do we have here? Uh, right now we just have a list of expressions. I think what we want to do is we want to have a special notion of a case expression. Um, and I guess a case expression um, yeah. Uh, case expression, so let's see. You probably want to have switch case. Um, case um, item um, pattern. Let's call it a pattern. Um, so we'll just have two of these. Uh, 
and uh, then in switch case. Okay, so currently we're just doing it that way. So um, let's try to get the existing stuff to work before we add the new thing, just using this new data structure. So I think uh, what we want to do is we want to go here and rather than accumulating, um, we will accumulate these instead. Um, and so we will do something like this, um, and then we will say if match token token ellipsis. Um, Then we will parse another one, and then we're just going to return that. Um, I'm going to call it this uh, parse switch case pattern. Um, so this is in the printer. You know what? I've been meaning to remove this for a while. So let's just kill it with extreme prejudice because I want to re-implement this in a different way. So let's just kill the, all that crap. Anyway, um, so this is in the resolver. It's going to be num patterns. Um, Um, for now, let's just, let's call this the start expression. So this is start, um, it's the start off rand. And then in the generator, um, kind of similar to before, so switch case pattern, um, switch, this is of course num patterns, switch case patterns j. Um, so for this, we're just going to say pattern start. Um, Okay, so let's just eyeball the code as well. So it looks like this stuff is still fine. Uh, and presumably, if you look at next token, that's also going to look fairly reasonable. Right. Um, actually, one thing I'm not even checking right now, so that, that's actually a bug. I should check that these are constants. Um, resolve const expression. I think resolve constant expression actually already. Okay. Um, Okay, that was the wrong button. Let me just verify that this actually, so, so this was something that I wasn't 
So if I put in something like, I don't know, like Lexer, right, so that would not have triggered before, so that was a bug, so good, always good to fix bugs. Um, if end expression, if it's optional, then uh, we want to. Okay, and so now we should be able to do um, this. And it should ignore, like it should kind of type check it and parse it. But like if, for example, if you put in, like, I don't know, if I put in Lexer here, that should complain of an error. Um, I guess the other thing you should check is that it actually has, oh yeah, no, it, so it, it checks that it's integer type up here. So that's that part is fine. Um, I think you want to um let's see here. Okay, let's be a little bit loose for now, but yeah, I think you want to make sure that the interval is actually reasonable. Um but um anyway, so here we're just handling the start case. Um, I think what you actually want to do is this is a little bit annoying because in the generator you don't necessarily know the constant value. Um, resolved. You don't necessarily know the constant value. Um, And you need to know that in order to generate the range. I mean, it's not hard. We, I think we're just going to, we have this whole notion of like the resolved type and stuff. We're just going to make one called resolved operand. Uh, and maybe that's what it should have been all along. But um, for now, I'm not going to change the existing use cases. I'm just going to um, um, to do something like this. I'm only going to add it for the specific cases we need. Um, set resolved operand. Oh, actually, one thing that's annoying about doing that for operand. Um, so let's let's not do operands because they can't fit in a UN64. Let's do resolved const. Uh, what is it? Any? Yeah, get resolved. const and it get, you get back an any um, and I guess do we call it any no I think we call it val um, and so Do this, and then we uh, have to do something like this. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, copy from val. Sounds like val. Map put sixty-four uh, resolved val map. Resolved val map. Um, resolved val map, and then we put in under pointer in u sixty-four. Uh, 
snap get. Okay, so that specific combination I had not uh, done. Well, we can also just do, no, we can't do that because that has variable size. Um, let me just do that front end. We always are complaining about this. Clearly some unbalanced stuff. Um, oh, here. Um, Gotta love these MSVC errors, although this one I guess is excusable. Um, so put UN64 pointer U64. Um, map get UN64. Um, Say that does not exist. Well, I should probably use these instead. Get UN64 from UN64, so we get this, then we cast this to UN64. Put this, we take a pointer key and a UN64 val. We put it in. Oh. Okay. Um. All right, and then let us in something with the patterns here. Um, I'm going to convert this to type UN64 so that we can have a uniform type. Is that the right thing to do? Yeah, let's do it that way. We can recover the type on the other side using the resolve type map. So convert it after we check that it matches, uh, do this conversion, and then uh, to unify the type, and then we say set resolve val uh, start expression start operand val ULL, something like this. Different types for formal and actual type. Oh yeah, sorry, do long long. All right, now we can actually just pass this directly. I guess we actually don't have to do this. Maybe we do.
Okay, that's the issue. Oh yeah, I forgot. This is one of those really annoying things about using the way we're using these maps right now. Um, all right, you know what? Let's push the stack and um, I'm going to leave. I'm going to not undo the code, but since it was already compiling, just not with the new range stuff. Um, I know how I want to handle this. I just don't want to deal with it right now. Um, so let's do this. So for today, we'll just uh, bite the bullet, but I, I will put this in after the stream today. Basically what we have to do is, um, first off, something that I've been wanting to do for a while, um, which is, um, have, have a good way to basically handle um, values that are equal to zero um, rather than using zero values as sentinels. It's pretty, there's this simple trick you can use, but anyway, don't want to do it right now. Um, so yeah, let's just uh, go back to the uh, to the good old hand cranked ranges. Do it the old fashioned way for now. Um, Um, and then uh, we will just use the logic we had here, minus the keyword logic, I think. Um, so let's see here. As long as we have an alphanumeric stream or we have an underscore, then we advance. Um, and then once we're done, let's call this stir. Token kind, token data stir. Um, for now, we don't make a distinction. Right, we have to use the Lexer interns. I guess that might be a good way or a good reason to uh, change this. Should just be like that anyway. All right, so at this point, if you do something like this, um, All right. 
on startup project. So you can see that we correctly parsed these and you can see by the pointer value that um, they got interned to an identical uh, location, which is what we want. And if we have some, uh, some other thing, that should get a different location as indeed it does. Just to answer a question in chat, I, you're, you might be right about the mem copy thing. I, sh I should check that. The um, the um, uh, someone was asking on chat. Um, I'm not using zero as a sentinel value for values, uh, only keys. So I don't understand a certain val. That's actually a good point. Um, I think yeah. The, the the reason I did that, and it's not a good reason, uh, is because Zero is used as a sentinel value for the return on the return side. So you can't tell the difference between something that is put in the map that has a val of zero versus something that is absent and that, where you get that value as a return signal, basically. But I think that's actually fine. I think what that means is, um, let's see here. I think you're right. I think what you want to do is um, you want to say something like this. If not val, then you just return, basically. Because from an interface perspective, um, if you put in a zero, it's you like there's no difference between putting in a zero value and not putting in a value at all under that key. So I think this is actually what you want to do. Uh, now that I think about it, and probably after this. Um, does that make sense? Because, like, basically, if you call get on a key, you get zero if there's nothing there. That's just a convention we have. So there's the default value for the map is zero. Uh, and I, so I think that's what I was thinking about, but I think the proper way to handle this is probably something like this, although I haven't thought through all the implications. Um, And with that out of the way, maybe let's actually try doing the thing we were talking about. I'll give it I'll give it like five minutes, uh and, and then if I don't get past it. And yeah, you're right, I could also have like a, ma a map has function to make that distinction, but right now it's kind of convenient to have a sentinel value. Um Okay, um so yeah, type U long long set resolved val um, start expression start operand val um, and same thing here with the end operand end expression end operand val um, And I think you said that I had a buffer overflow here because I did a copy. Um, as far as I know, we'll put it here. It probably should be a static assert. Um, this should be true. Is there an issue with static asserts? Anyway, let's just make it a, a non-static assert. Um, okay, so 
Um, so that's it for that. Now we need to go to the generator. And basically, th this is where generating idiomatic C code is going to take some extra effort because um, we would need to determine, like, should we print it as ASCII or not? And how do you communicate that to the back end? And you can definitely determine that uh, using some heuristics. But for now, I think um, I am just going to um, let me think so so right now if you generate um, okay let me do the following logic uh, if uh, pattern end then we do one thing otherwise we do this so we still have the nice for now at least and, and eventually this other one will be nicer as well but for now uh, we, we use this gen expressure thing here um, but then we want to do something like start val and val basically um, so you want to get start val um, get resolved val pattern start pattern end um, okay that's fine and then you want to say something like I mean we kind of assume I guess that it's u64 uh, so maybe I should for, for now, we'll just assume that there's that coupling to how we actually stick it in there. Um, So yeah, I mean, this is kind of the problem, if you will. Um, and, and maybe to make it nice for the time being, I will do something like this. Um, um, So that at least you can see what they were intending. The reason we can't emit this directly, actually, maybe we can emit that directly. No, we 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 can't, of course, because it's not supported. But anyway, um, let's say that's a compromise for now. That is functional, but kind of ugly, to say the least. Um, but it will let us cut down on this crap. Which is nice. And it works. I should check with mixed case and stuff.
So yeah, so this is how it looks now in this end, which is obviously ugly as sin, but um, there, there is a way we can reclaim this heuristically by just looking at like if the start expression is a character literal and the end expression is a character literal then we print them as character you know as character literals rather than as uh, integer literals but um, functionally this should be okay at least uh, one thing I do want to check in the resolver is that um, the interval is well behaved If this is And so, for example, so everything should still work. Um, but if you, if you, for example, if you reverse this, you should get an error now. And in fact, that would be true even for something. Actually, I guess that's not true. Um, if you do. I guess there's no reason to disallow a range of size one, even though it's a, a weird idiom. Um, Okie dokie. This one potential problem with this approach here is that it doesn't work correctly with negative stuff. Um, no, but I will leave that for now. So this should now be allowed. Um, All right, this is not the most production quality implementation of this feature, but uh, I will handle it off stream in a more appropriate way. But at least we now have a very nice and concise thing here. Alrighty, um, so I think we have, aside from, I guess we, we, we also need some basic other tokens like commas and semi, maybe semicolons or whatever. I guess we should do comments as well. That's kind of, kind of another generic thing we will want to have. Um, I guess maybe, yeah, let's put it down here. I guess we'll. I guess we can literally just take this stuff. And just fall. At the division. I don't think we want this, but we do want this. Uh, Lexer token kind, blah, blah, blah. Hmm. 
Vamos a tener el costado 8 ahora. Lexer. Yeah, I guess calling it line number is maybe not necessary. We can just call it line. Still work as before. Now if we put in, I don't know. Should not be there. Should not be there either. Um, I, mean, I guess should have some generic function for some of this printing, but um, let's just make sure that this new token is actually handled as well. Yep. This reminds me. Um, the follow-up from yesterday that I didn't mention is that I added go to and labels, um, which I should have remarked on. Uh, but this was again me getting annoyed at the fact that uh, we didn't have go tos, and I was porting the code, and I was like, "Yeah, wait." But anyway, go tos. Um, the, the 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 one gotcha with go tos is the syntax for labels is that you can't really use this syntax like you can in C because we already have this for things like this, um, right? So uh, this does not really this is not LL1 parsable at all. So I'm using a prefix colon. Um, the specific syntax is subject to change, but this seems like the most C-like while not being exactly like C syntax I could think of. Um, and uh, one thing that's different from C is that this is considered a standalone token, or sorry, a standalone statement. Uh, whereas in C, there's an annoying thing where, for example, you can't do... Um, What's an example? You, oh yeah, this is the classic example. In C, you can't do this. You can't do this. Um, because a, a label always comes before a statement. It's not a statement in itself. So you always have to do something like, you know, if, if you have some, you know, if you want to go to the end here, uh, you always have to have this dummy semicolon uh, for an empty statement, which is a little bit silly probably. Um, so the, I, I decided syntactically to just make our labels be standalone statements. And then on the C side, they actually always generate this kind of pairing uh, with an empty statement to make sure they're always valid in any context. But uh, yeah. Um, I understand why C did it, but it's just annoying because like, you know, the idea of having an end statement is actually, well, it's a little bit silly maybe because you could just have done a return, but uh, you run into that sometimes. It's It's a little bit... It's it's usually not a big deal, but um, it's a little bit. I don't know if it's silly, but I always get surprised by it anyway. Um, all right. Um, so let's think about um, doing some simple. Uh, what kind of syntax we want for the basic. Um, the basic, um, the basic assembler. Uh, one, one thing that's, and this is one thing actually we'll have to change about the lexer um, between an assembler and um, and something like Ion is that assemblers are usually have line oriented syntax. So, for example, if you write something like this. Uh, you don't terminate with a semicolon, and there's not even semicolon insertion or anything like that. It like the syntax is fundamentally line oriented, and that's what people expect from assemblers. Um, and so we are of course going to have that too. And so one thing that's different is that we all we certainly would want to make um, which is not true right now in our test cases we'll actually have to change to accommodate it, but we won't want to make um, new lines actually be a token. We will still ignore this other stuff as just being garbage, I guess. Uh, I guess one potentially nice thing about this is that you can move this kind of stuff in there. 
So you don't have to handle it as part of that clause. Um, but yeah, it, it, I mean, the, the, the old code will still work. Let's see. Oh yeah, token kind. Um, okay, so clearly that was not a successful. <laughs> Because we have to actually do this. Skip it. And so now we actually have new lines. Uh, explicitly in the token stream as opposed to them just being kind of ignored completely so the parser can actually match on new lines which is what you want um, by the way regarding these case ranges um, I think uh, David uh, suggested you know, having both inclusive and exclusive using one or two dots. I think that kind of stuff is too tricky in my opinion. I've actually had language, I've played with language syntax before where I've done things like that. Um, I think in case ranges, you almost always want inclusive anyway. And so since this is not gonna be some general syntax for like loop iteration or whatever, this seems probably uh, like a good reasonable compromise. Most of the cases I can think of would be inclusive and having two syntaxes for something marginal anyway, this is a fairly marginal feature in the grand scheme of things. Seems uh, probably a little more trouble than it's worth, but um, anyway. All right. Um, yeah, so uh, line-oriented syntax. Um, to start off with, let's do the bare minimum thing, which is we have an instruction per line. We have labels. So the way labels work is, um, you know, identifier like name. So like a label is a name followed by a semicolon uh, or colon, sorry. So these are lexical tokens. And then a, um, gosh, I can't remember what you normally call it in assembler, um, like one command, one, one line, uh, directive. Yeah, I don't know. Um, let's just call it line. Um, one line consists of. Let's see. An instruction consists of uh, a name, um, let's see, um, a name and then a bunch of arguments separated by commas. So one, one thing I've, I was thinking of a little bit off stream is um, when you're doing something like an assembler, rather than completely separating the syntax from the meaning of, like, I think it probably makes more sense to intertwine the parsing and the understanding of what instructions are available and what kind of syntax they require a little more. So for example, rather than having a generic instruction syntax and then dispatching sort of on the back end to the different kinds of instructions, it might make a lot of sense to sort of, as you're parsing, you know, you 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 look at the name and then based on that, you have sort of specific, specific sub grammar rules that handle those specific instructions. And so for example, you might have like a reg reg instruction, in which case, you know, you have, I don't know, three arguments and all of them are registers or something like that. Um, so, um, I think that's probably what we're going to do. And so, for example, if you want to parse uh, reg reg uh, instruction, well, you yeah, we're an ion, so let's say we're doing something like this. Um, you would you would do uh, 
well, let's, let's, let's say we first get, we get past this end because in order to dispatch to the right type of thing from the outside, it's going to uh, probably do a look ahead. And I guess we can do that in here too. And so you'll do like parse name. Um, and then you will, uh, you know, you'll, you'll, you, you could do something like this. And let's just call it parse reg. Something like this. And you could do this from the inside, but it probably makes more sense to um, to do this kind of thing outside the individual, like to, to sort of factor that out a little bit. But this would be kind of one way to do this. And you can even, you can probably, yeah, you want to factor this out here. And then you, you pass that in. Um, so, I think we're going to take this approach rather than parsing a very generic format and then targeting it for specific instruction types on the back end. Um, so rather than having some general parse operand uh, thing, like eventually we're going to want to have stuff like parse reg actually support macros, for example, in a macro assembler fashion. But for now, I'm, I think I'm going to do something along these lines. And I may change that later, but this seems like a reasonable way to start it. Um, so I guess that brings us to the parser part rather than just the lexer. So the way I plan on, you know, again, we're not going to have this global state. Uh, we're going to have everything be packaged and uh, packaged up and passed around explicitly. And so the parser contains a lexer object um, and um, it uses that anytime it needs to get another token or whatever. Um, and for now, let's just say that's all we have. Um, and then we are basically going to take these helper uh, yeah stuff like this is kind of generic enough that we will um, you know we will want to have that in any case did OBS disconnect or did my twitch stream just okay there it is. there it is drop that for a sec um, so yeah, you can do stuff like this, of course. No, I guess we can't really. I guess, yeah, this does have to be anchored to the parser. So you can do stuff like is token. And you will want to do lexer parser token kind equals this. So all of these things will kind of move over as a result. Um, don't know how useful this is. Um, this one seems useful. Yeah, let's just write it out. Lexer token and we should make it like this by value. There's no reason to um, to not own it. Parser lexer token stir. All right, it's data. And uh, we don't have keywords right now. Um, match token is useful.
guess we just have a few of these right now. So like token new line. That we might as well set up for the future. Um, so this is. I guess this should really be like Lexer V error. Um, See here. Too few arguments. Oh, right here. Um, this should be token or a parser lexer token, something like that. And then parser error. I guess for now we can just, rather than calling it. I mean, this is called like V error, to be honest. Um, no, because it does use the lexer. Let's use lexer V error, parser lexer, um, format, and then args. All right. Yeah. Um so let's um Let's see here. Um. Oops. 
Maybe this is just an int, to be honest. Um, so for uh, for x reg, you basically want like x zero, x one, up to x thirty two. The thing I'm pondering is the best way to handle this parsing wise. I think you just use a map, probably. Um, so like you have, um, oh, it's a little bit annoying because we can't really use globals for that, I guess. This is just going to be part of the parser. Um, Um, I mean, you could just have like a stretchy buff as well. Do a linear lookup, but let's just use a map to be. I think that's probably the easiest thing to do here, honestly. Um, torn between different ways of doing this, as simple as it is, though. Um, I guess it's four. Yeah, we could map, we, we could handle it in the Lexer. Um, yeah, we could handle it in the Lexer. That's true. It's maybe a better way to do it. The one annoying thing about it is it kind of starts to interfere with the rest of this uh, general name parsing. Um, like, it's kind of nice if keywords and names go through the same path, but uh, I'm not averse to. Um, to make an exception. Let me just think about it though. The thing we could do is we could mark it as a keyword and then each keyword has associated with it metadata of which it could be that this is a register and the register number is whatever. I think that's what I'm going to do. So basically keywords have additional data associated with them. Um, and then we associate the, the you know, X32 or whatever. We, we say this is an X register and the number is 32. I think I like that. So it's going to be part of the keyword data. I think that's the way to do it, but still use the hash map for it.
Um, does that make sense? So basically, um, let's see here, token. So right now we have token name. And uh, I think what we're going to do is Let's see how we handle the keywords here, right? We have this keyword name thing. Um, Yeah, we could probably use some similar mechanism. Um, Um, let's see, it's keyword name, yeah. And I think you you want to probably do something like for init lexer. Um, Let's just do it like this. Um,
Well, that doesn't quite work that way. I was hoping to do it with a linear array. I could use a map, um, but it would be nice to have a flat buffer like this. But basically the plan is, so we, we, we uh, just forget about this keyword data for a sec. First off, we have the same approach for identifying keywords versus non-keywords that we had in the old lecture. But my idea is keywords have additional auxiliary data associated with them. So like, you know, if you're an X register keyword, you can go and look at the, at the you know, at the reg field to determine what, what register number it has, that kind of thing. Um, But the question is, where should that data be stored? Um, sorry, let me just get a drink. What is the best place to store it? this way. So this is a stretchy buff, just like this is a stretchy buff, and then you use this to get the location. This point square into this buffer. I think that works. Um, Get name Um, you know, honestly, if you're doing this, I don't think you need this first last stuff because we already have a map. If, and if we need to go through that map to fill in the token data, um, then why not uh, put that in in the first place? So then I think basically you do something like this. Add keyword uh, name data. And we intern it first, which is item potent, so even doing that redundantly is fine. Um, and then once we have that, um, we will Uh, I have to go to the bathroom badly, actually, and uh, I realized that it's just up with the time. So I will uh, cut off the stream here and continue in the extra stream. Um, 
after getting a bathroom break, which will take approximately one minute, but I will uh, I'll keep the stream on, but I'll just uh, cut off the recording and restart it. So be right back. <laughs> 